So uh, in the spirit of excellence, um, African excellence at Setsi, we always start on time and we try our best to end on time. So we want to make sure that we um, keep that spirit alive. So I want to begin this session um, by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge all our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all those community elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, learn, build together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So I, I give thanks for you all um, and your punctuality and your leadership. And as I mentioned before, we're going to let folks in as they join us. But the fact remains, we want to we want to begin, and we want to make sure that we um, demonstrate the excellence that we we require in community. Um, so uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our panelists today. Um, first, our remarkable co colleague, Christine Clark. Um, Christine has been doing some remarkable work in community for a very long time. I'm not going to read out the bios of all our panelists, primarily because we want to make sure we have a robust conversation. Um, but Christine, can you introduce yourself to our folks here? Thanks, Victor. I'm Christine Clark. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the co-founder of Freedom Dreams Cooperative Education. And we are a knowledge hub and co-op development service. And we share um, uh, the histories, we share um, the contributions of Black, Indigenous, and person of color communities to the cooperative movement. And we also support the development of Black, Indigenous, and person of color co-ops through the creation of culturally relevant educational resources. Thanks again, Victor, for inviting me. Ashe, thank you so much, Christine. We're gonna hand that off to our colleague, Esther. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to join you. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Women's Smart Cultural Resource and Counseling Center of Durham Region. We've been in the community for the past 29 years. We are looking forward to celebrating our 30th anniversary in May 2023. The organization was founded in 1993, uh, initially to deal with issues of gender-based violence in our community as they impacted the lives of newcoming immigrants, refugees, and racialized uh, women, youth, and children in Durham region. Later on in our journey, we, expand, we extended to include um, entrepreneurship because we know, of course, women who experience violence after part of their integration in the community is for them to have economic autonomy to support themselves and to support their families. So we decided to incorporate also a worker cooperative and women entrepreneurship to help women to advance for economic, uh, to progress, to advance for economic prosperity. So <laughs> for economic prosperity, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know so, exactly what you're saying. You're there. So help them to achieve their economic prosperity. Yes. Thank you so much, Esther. We appreciate your leadership and all the work that you do. We're going to hand it off to our colleague, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here with you all. Um, I'm joining you from the uh, traditional lands of uh, the Tecaranto, traditional lands of the Mississaugas uh, of the First Credit, the Hiramwendat and the Haudenosaunee and Métis people. Um, I am really pleased to be here today and I'm representing Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada. Um, and I am the uh, uh, program manager for social innovation and social finance partnerships with um, Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada. And I've been in this role for the past seven months. And essentially my role is to really encourage the cooperative um, sector to uh, seek um, in, in investment into uh, some programs and, pro and projects that they would like to see put forward in their communities to strengthen and impact and uplift their community. So that is the role that I, am, uh, that I have taken on at Cooperatives and Mutuals. And I look forward to uh, the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Opi. We appreciate you. We're going to hand it off to our colleague, Obi.
Abi, you're muted. Yeah, I just did that. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Obi Agusegbe. I saw that um, Victor put Obegeli. <laughs> that's my name. As that's the full name from Obi. That's the full name of Obegi. That's the full name of Obi. Even though my parents do call me Obi, they all call me Obi. But Obegeli actually means um, someone that came into this world in time of plenty, right? So we're not meant to suffer. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I have over 20 years in environmental management and sustainability um, consulting. Um, I run, um, I wear multiple hats, I, I, I wear multiple hats, I'll say. Um, so I am co vice president, co founder vice president of Black Women Professional Worker Co op. I'm also the founder and CEO of Environment Focus Incorporated and also founder of Sustainable Community Aid Network. Um, I've been working cooperatively since I started like forever, right? Because when you're dealing with um, environmental issues, you cannot work alone. You always have to work with people. Otherwise, you're, so, you're, not, um, you're not doing what you're supposed to do because the environment is an ecosystem. So I've always worked in an ecosystem type of way from the very beginning. And even the way um, in terms of the education, in terms of... Um, experience. So um, I'm very happy to be here um, representing the Black Women Worker Co-op, Black Women Worker Professional, Black Women Professional Worker Co-op, um, Environment Focus, and SCAN, because with the Black Women Worker Co-op, it's, it's an umbrella for all Black women and what they bring to the table. Um, so really, my mission really is to create and implement innovative programs that ensures that the environment, the people's well-being are given the same consideration as a need for business to be profitable. So in terms of the cooperative space, I live by it, I work by it, and it's something that I'm very passionate about, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. No, thank you. We appreciate you and all the lived experience that you bring to this conversation. Thank you so much. And we're going to hand it off last but not least to our colleague, Juliet. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Juliet Kego Umonido, and I'm here representing the Black Women Professional Worker Co-op and also the Whole Women Network, which is an informal um, cooperative. Um, so basically, with the Black Women Professional Worker Co-op, we work with women um, specifically in the food space um, to take their products from kitchen um, to, you know, um, retail the bigger um, chains. And one of the things that we also do is that we create a, a cooperative partnership between women in the global north and then women in the global south, so um, countries like Nigeria, Rwanda, um, Ghana specifically. And with the Whole Woman Network, we've run um, a culturally attuned, like something we're really proud of, um, and um, trauma-informed um, um, financial literacy program since 2010, um, reached thousands of people. And now we're incorporating um, the ROSCA model into this and creating partnerships with um, organizations like MIQ, and, and some academics. So we're really happy about that direction um, for you know, um, financial literacy that speaks to our community and, and shows us clear results. So really great to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's funny because there's only one colleague that I wanted here, but the timing wouldn't work. It's our colleague Wunmi from Blooming Ladies Co-op. But when I think about the cooperative ecosystem and I think about co-ops in general, the first thing that comes to mind is Black women. And the fact that the co first cooperative models were around childcare, around gro grocery, around food, around land, around agriculture. And it was led by Black women since time immemorial. And years ago, I had a conversation with my good colleague, Daniel Burnett, um, specifically around his database and the amount of Black co-ops within the country. And I can tell you, he's done remarkable work over the past few years, actually doing the ecosystem excavation and mapping around Black co-ops in Canada. Um, my first question to you, Christine, is, and this aligns with just our conference in general, it seems like folks are so interested in impact investing. We just left a conversation with 48 people on an early Saturday morning. Um, folks are interested in capital, in, in interesting ways um, and, and capitalism. 
But when it comes to cooperative economics, it seems like the federal government, the provincial governments, municipalities, even communities don't recognize the power of the cooperative principles. So I want um, to hear from you in terms of Freedom Dreams Co-op, how do you hold dear the principles of cooperatives? Thanks for that great question, Victor. Um, you know, how we hold dear the principles of cooperatives. Well, first, it, it, it's what you just mentioned is recognizing that we're standing on the shoulders of those Black women who um, are doing this work, and I'm surrounded by them in this, in this panel, and have done that work because Freedom Dreams actually came out of me being inspired by Fannie Lou Hamer who was a civil rights activist, a politician, a farmer um, uh, in the US and started the Freedom Farm Cooperative as a way to um, ensure, um, you know, Black, uh, you know, food, like Black food sovereignty, land access, et cetera. And so just um, telling the story of the cooperative movement, you know, through our contributions and the ways that we've used the co-op principles or the co-op movement, not just as an economic tool, but as a tool to um, survive um, white supremacy, white violence and sabotage, um, and then move toward thriving. So the, the cooperative principles, yes, there's a very certain set of seven principles, um, but underlay, underlying that is the ways that we use this model to survive, to resist, and then to thrive. And that underpins what we do at Freedom Dreams when we produce educational content, because that's the bridge. We're still fighting that fight today. And in order to make that relevant to our communities, it's knowing that this is how we use that cooperative tool, as well as the joyful ways that we use that tool in terms of building social bonds, strengthening family bonds, strengthening, strengthening communal bonds. Um, and so that, that is what those co-op principles, um, that's how it just interweaves itself throughout our work. Thank you so much for all those actionable insights, your brilliance, guidance, and wisdom as always, Christine. Thank you. And when you bring up Fannie Lou Hamer, I think of um, Dr. God, Jessica gordon Nemhard and her book, Collective Courage. I think of the work that um, Dr. Carolyn Shinez Hussein is doing, um, and, and so many other Black women in academia that are um, uh, that are doing some of the research that informs practice and, and, and those on the ground. So my next question um, is specifically to you, Juliet. In terms of the work that your organization is facilitating, what are some of the ways that you're amplifying um, the cooperative movements and cooperative economics within Canada and internationally? Thank you, Thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I think, I, and I love that you um, paid homage to these women, um, especially those in the academic um, field, um, um, Dr. Jessica, Dr. Um, Shanaz um, Hussein, um, um, Dr. Keisha Blaine, there's so many of them, right? And what they're doing is actually creating the foundation for us to be heard, to be seen, and to have the confidence to go on that global stage, right, to share this work around um, 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 cooperative economics and, and the black social economy. So for us, we, we took a very strategic approach um, in that when we started um, first with Whole Woman Network before we then um, created the formalized um, Black Women Professional Worker Corp, we went back to history to say, okay, what has been done, right? Who are these, who are these pioneers? Who are these ancestors that have laid the groundwork? And for us, we went back as far as the Inri Kingdom, which is like 14th century in the Southeastern Nigeria and realized that that's how they've always lived. And so there's this bifurcation of when colonialism, you know, the whole capitalism, Christianity, all of that came in and uprooted a way of being for a people. So understanding that this is something we've always done. And then along the line, there was a system that displaced that. And we've been struggling ever since to get back to those roots. So for us, it was important to then create a set of criteria. Number one, we knew that this definition of, for instance, cooperativism, even the, the solidarity economy was, there was a way that it excluded Blacks 
and even all BIPOCs, right? Um, um, people of color, indigenous community. And so it was important for us to situate ourselves in that conversation using our own language. So we went back to create what we term as um, um, indigenous a value system. And there's an organization in Nigeria that did that work. I was part of that committee where they created 12 values that were core to who we are. And it was interesting that in our research, we looked at the values around Kwanzaa, for instance, done by, you know, again, another academic in the US and saw the intersection. So the seven values of Kwanzaa were already in the 12 values that we discovered from centuries ago, right? And, and from there, we went on to this conversation around ESG. How do we bring it in? How do we take the SDGs, for instance, from the UN, all 17 of them, and make them culturally attuned? So we started doing that work. And it's a great thing that Obi is here because she's doing fantastic work around that, which is mapping our values as Black people against the SDG so that it's relevant to us. So if the if the UN or the World Bank says poverty is below a threshold of a dollar a day, what does that mean to us, right? What's the language for us? In my culture, poverty is obeying. It means someone whom the community uplifts. That's totally different from the Western view. So you see that even in how we define problems, cooperation comes in. So for us, Amplifying this messaging of saying indigenous knowledge, indigenous frameworks are critical to us building systems that are for alternative economies, but that can also be integrated with what is in a way that we don't lose our voice. So again, huge thank you to the academics that are doing the work. Dr. Hussein, for instance, um, from um, U of T has given us the tools for us to speak about this everywhere. And so we're speaking in different, you know, globally, locally, um, on different platforms and just amplifying that work. Thank you. Ashe, Ashe, thank you so much. And when, when you when you speak about that, I think of yesterday's panel. So we had a panel called When Elders Speak in Toronto. It was a live panel, three panels as part of our four-day conference. And Elder Abena Janelle Skirit, who's the co-founder of Banker Lady <laughs> Documentary, <laughs> with Elder Abena um, shared the importance of susus and box hands and partners. Um, but Atif Baskiari, the CEO of the North Pine Foundation, spoke of money as a form of medicine, similar to Ed Edgar at the Decolonizing Wealth Institute. And earlier today in our impact investing panel, our colleague Robin Wisner spoke about the fact that money doesn't do, people do. So when you correlated all that IP that you just shared with us and brought up the principles of Kwanzaa, the Nguzu Saba, um, principles like Ujima, Ujama, cooperative economics, I think of two principles specifically. I, I, I think of Kuji Chagalia, self-determination, and the eighth principle of the Nguzu Saba, which a lot of people aren't familiar with, Kuji Stai, respect. And, I, I, and that Kuji Chagalia principle of self-determination is epitomized in this conversation, specifically around resourcing. So I'm going to go to you, Esther. How do you feel um, co-ops, especially Black women co-ops within Canada, are being resourced and supported and amplified and invested in right now? Or is it a model where you have to remain in this space of resilience and resistance and trying to acquire resources as opposed to funders and resources courting you as they should? You're on mute, sis. Well, as we all know, Black women are talented. When you look at our ancestors from Africa, from Caribbean, they got these skills. These women, they might be mothers of 10. They might not have the formal skill like women of today have, but they managed to maintain their family. They managed to feed their children. They managed to clothe them. They managed to still send them to school and, and provide them with the basic life necessities. So those women, when they come to Canada, they bring with them those skills. But systemic nobody these women brought 
with them from their countries of origin. So it is about time institutions like us, organizations, help those women, help to amplify their skills, help to uh, help them to achieve their goals and what they want to achieve with um, uh, with um, uh, cooperative. So uh, WMRCC developed uh, seven cooperative three years ago through the grants we received from, from Ontario Trillium Foundation. And majority of those cooperatives are owned by black women. Black women from Africa, the continent, uh, black women from the Caribbean. And also some of these co-op are also owned by racialized women, women from Southeast Asia, women from the mis Middle East and South Asian women. So we help them because these women, they have skills. They used to run their businesses. They used to sew. They used to do different things. They have the skills, but in Canada, they couldn't know. They didn't know how to use those skills. And running this cooperative project encouraged them to get into partnership with each other so that they can, they, so that those skills can be amplified. With the cooperative we develop, we were able to develop uh, several cooperative groups within two years. And those cooperatives are in interpreters and translations uh, platform Cooperative Inc is one of the cooperative we develop. And another one is um, Cleaners Cooperative of Ontario. And another one is Harmony Creation Sewing Cooperative. And another one is Kumba Chai Care Cooperative. And this Kumba Chai Care Cooperative is using Afrocentric approach of child care for this cooperative group. That's why the name is Kumba. It tells a lot. Uh, we have Ebony Care Cooperative, which is PSW uh, group. And we have also Beauty, Beauty and Spa. Uh, and the final one is Artist and Photography group. So these women, we need inclusive economy because we are lacking that. We need to develop more cooperative groups to support uh, Black women and racialized women and indigenous women. These women have talents, they have skills, but how can we support them to, to use those skills they have in forming cooperative to help them to build the economy, to help them to be financial and uh, sustainable? to run their businesses. So um, WMRCC is hoping to continue to develop more cooperative groups uh, because we don't want to stop with these seven we develop. We want to develop more groups and we need to mobilize ourselves if we cannot find job or if we, if we cannot make it through the main economic, we have to build our own social structure, social system to support us to do what we need to do within our power. So I hope I answered your question and I can speak more later on. Thank you so much. And you did more than answer it. You provided a lot of context. And once again, um, we applaud your leadership for developing all those co-ops, my sister. Remarkable work. We give thanks. You make our ancestors proud. Um, my next question is to Shopi. Um, in terms of your work and your journey right now um, at CMC, I know that there's a lot of work being done on a policy level and really amplifying the co-op ecosystem in Canada. How has that journey been for you um, so far as a Black woman? Thank you for that question, um, Victor. Um, it, it's been an interesting journey for sure, um, being a, a Black woman in this in this area and certainly working with an organization um, that is an umbrella organization representing cooperatives across Canada and advocating for cooperatives um, in the general public as well as to the government. Um, one of the things that um, I do in my role um, is that I try to 
of outreach to uh, underrepresented groups and certainly um, Black women are one of those underrepresented groups. And so I have reached out to some of the women here that are on the panel with me today and have been able to deliver um, webinars um, to their to their groups and have also asked them to please uh, connect me with other people. And so for me, it has been a true learning experience. I, I know that, and CMC as an organization knows that um, these cooperatives exist, but there has been a struggle in terms of um, getting into in touch with them and amplifying their voices. And I feel that having um, my myself in this role has really enabled me to be able to make those connections. Um, my my sister Juliet and I are, are from the same uh, uh, nation, which is Nigeria originally. And there was that in, immediate in affinity when I first met her at our Congress in the summer. And from there, the relationship formed and I was able to con she was able to connect me with other people, uh, other women in um, the cooperative space that are black women that perhaps it would have been a much more difficult um, task to accomplish were I not in this role. So um, I hope that answers the question, but it's it's been it's been quite an interesting journey. Um, but I have I feel like I have been supported by the women um, that I am also trying to support, and so it's there's a mutual support there, which I think is uh, speaks to the cooperative principles as well, um, cooperation amongst co um, uh, amongst cooperatives. So uh, I thank the women who have supported me, and um, thank you so much. Thank you for that remarkable answer and all your actionable insights. We appreciate your work and your leadership. Our next question is to you, Obi. In terms of solidarity amongst women in the co-op ecosystem, how has that been for you? Because obviously, um, the, in the spirit of Ubuntu, Ubuntu, I am because we are, I'm seeing such dynamism in terms of women working together in the co-op ecosystem. How has that journey been for you? You're on mute, sis. Hi, thanks, Vito, for that question. Yeah, it's been, um, I would say it's been very, it's been a great experience, right? Um, like I had said, I've been cooperative, you know, cooperatively, right? But in terms of working on the core, right? Um, it was, and traditionally, yes, very familiar with the co-op system, but it was Julia, right? That um, really brought, like, brought me into the system in Ontario, like in this in this space, right? And really introduced me into the system and then with all the um, um, lingual. And working with, and we've been all together, I think we started off 10 women and the dynamic has been very interesting. Like we've, we've had our struggles, we've had our back and forth, we've had, and we've, you know, and with all, we've grown together, right? Um, uh, like I said, with my experience, I've always worked cooperatively, working with organizations, like work as an entity and bringing in organizations to work together, right? But working with the women, right, has really been interesting because we all bring different skill sets to the group, right? So we have the business analyst, we have um, Juliet, we have um, 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 manager, we have, uh, we have a banker, we have different people. So they all come in with different skill sets um, in terms of um, how we are going to work together, right? And it's been very interesting. And I think if more women, we open up more women working together and going through the growing pains, right? Experiencing um, situations and also empathy, right? Having empathy with one another, knowing that as women, we are faced with a lot of challenges, right? From different places, we're thrown Different, different things are thrown at us. So when working together, understanding, being empathetic towards each other, and understanding that yes, one person may, going through, be, may be going through a difficult time right now, but it does not mean that they are out. It doesn't mean that they're not interested. So I think it's to carry, it's carrying each other, carrying ourselves through the process, you know, carrying ourselves in time when it's hard, in time when it's easy. And then when one person is not able to participate, or bring the funds in or whatever it is, be patient with her because it does not mean that she does not want, but whatever life is thrown at her at that time may not be, she may not be able to do it. So I think it's been really, it's been really effective. And we're really looking forward to 
grow more. We're looking forward to all the wonderful things that will happen. We're looking forward to all the wonderful things, how we will help women grow, right? So even with um, um, organizations that I have, I'm running, like with SCAN, um, SCAN is a not-for-profit, and it's all about bringing networks together. So with SCAN, we, we have brought in a lot, we're working with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? Women entrepreneurs, and like, um, like um, Esther said, right? Women come in with their different skill set. They come in able to cook, able to as caterers, as um as um craft women, right? Um, they make soaps, they make all sorts of things, right? They they are strong on their own, but the system makes it difficult, right, for them to connect, for them to be sustainable, financially sustainable, right? So even with scan, what we started doing was like create like a virtual space where women can come and talk about what they do, what they are, what businesses they're going through what challenges are going to, just so that the younger people will see what they are doing, right? And learn from them and learn, understand their journey so that they can see how they can be like them and grow, grow, grow in that space, knowing that it's going to be good. It will eventually get better. And it's like the perseverance is the moving forward, is the creating networks, is the learning from um, people older than you, is learning from, um, so trying to work with what you have and not giving up. Do not give up. Move because it will get better. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you so much <laughs> for your leadership. We appreciate you, Obi. Um, my next question is for you, Christine. In terms of some of the systemic barriers and challenges that you face in the cooperative ecosystem, not just as a Black woman, or as a racialized person, or I, and I hate the word BIPOC, I, I actually use the word global majority group, but um, just as a Canadian in the cooperative ecosystem, what are some of those barriers that you face? Thanks, um, Victor. Uh, so what are the barriers that I face within the Canadian cooperative ecosystem? Um, many things come to mind. I'm going to try to um, um, speak to some of the most, um, the biggest obstacles, particularly to the development of BIPOC co-ops. I mean, we've heard, you know, Juliet, Obi, Esther, Shope talk about the work they're doing. And uh, particularly with BWPW co-op and WMRCC, we heard about the years that this work has been, been done in community. Yet when Freedom Dreams, you know, when we started, we were getting approached by a lot of the, you know, provincial co-op associations, national co-op associations, saying that, you know, they were having a, they, how do we get more Black communities, for example, in the co-op movement, as if this was like some new, you know, mathematical equation that they couldn't figure out, or as <laughs> if, you know, Black communities weren't interested in co-op development. Um, and so they're sitting kind of in their office, looking at their four walls, trying to figure out how to practice, you know, difficult equation yet, you know, Freedom Dreams in our, in our first year, being connected with Esther, Julia, we're already doing the work. There's no, <laughs> you know, unsolvable equation here. And so I think one of the biggest obstacles is, you know, there's a willful blindness, right? There's these provincial national associations who haven't really been going outside of their own walls to see and then support financially, um, importantly, um, the organizations that are already doing the work. And so this is why I also, you know, I briefly met Shope at the CMC Congress in Calgary but I think that question that you asked was, and, and the way she'll be answered it, as a Black woman in that role, and you know, being able to make those connections that otherwise couldn't have been made. You know, Shopee spoke about meeting Juliet and connecting also on a familial level. You know, um, so there that is a huge obstacle um, that I see in in um, the the space. Um, and connected to that is when we look at both provincial and national associations and organizations, they're predominantly white organizations. 
the co-op, if we talk about the ecosystem of co-op developers in Canada, the co-op developers are predominantly white. And so that presents an issue um, because there is that um, inability to connect um, within racialized communities, within global majority communities um, in order to do that that work. And, and I just want to quickly tell this, this story um, because we use the term co-op developer. And a good friend of mine, Esther West, who co-authored Latinx Co-op Power with Dr. Jessica Gordon Namhard, on top of all the amazing things Esther does in, in the co-ops in the US, said that they don't use the word co-op developer, right? Um, their father was a community organizer. Esther also has an educational background in urban planning and spoke about when you think about development, all of those connotations, you know, those negative connotations, when we think geopolitically, those connotations of development, and it largely speaks to people from outside of the community, you know, coming into a community with their idea of how that community should develop as opposed to community organizing, where you organize the strengths that exist within that community so that community can come up with their, and be resourced, not come up, be resourced, you know, um, um, for their solutions to their own problems. And so Esther uses the term co-op organizer. And I think that, you know, we also need to start using that language. Development is also a racialized term. And we need to start thinking in the terms of co-op organizing and resourcing um, folks within communities to start doing this co-op organizing work. And that's how we're going to start, you know, Esther said, we have to mobilize uh, within ourselves. This is how we start doing it so that we don't have to keep, you know, button our heads up against the systemic racism and these challenges that we have in a larger sector, that we've actually built this ecosystem, that we can continue doing what we're doing, which is solving our problems ourselves. Ashe, thank you so much for your leadership. I always get inspired by the way you conceptualize and frame this work and some of the insights that you provide. So once again, my sister Christine, thank you for your leadership. We really appreciate you. We're gonna go back to our colleague, Juliette. And sir, we, we've spoken a lot about the cooperative principles. We spoke about um, the work that black women have been doing since time immemorial in this ecosystem, in this space. But in the Canadian context right now, um, what are some of the systemic barriers that you see that are just maybe obvious to folks within the ecosystem, but not obvious externally? And I'll bring up one specifically. Every single panel we've had today has had more than 50. This is the least amount of individuals in our panels, think about that. And this is an all black woman led panel on the cooperative ecosystem. As well, the federal budget last year in Canada, guess how many times they named the word co-op? Does anyone know? Once. But remember the cooperative ecosystem yeah. employs over 200,000 people and is 4% of the GDP. So yeah. when we speak about those principles that we spoke of earlier today around Kudichagali, um, self-termination, cooperative economics, um, Ujima, Ujama, these principles are important to us as a people, but in the Canadian context, the cooperative sector is just that, a sector. So what are some of the systemic barriers that you see right now, Juliet, in your work? Okay, so um, thank you so much um, for that question. Um, I, I think, I mean, the, the, you know, you said the obvious ones and then the ones that are not obvious to maybe those um, in the sector, right? And, and for us, we look at it like if you, if you look at us as Black women, they're the obvious challenges, right? Around patriarchy, around um, racism, around classism, like we see that that intersection, right? Um, so if you kind of like um, expand that, how does that show up as barriers in our day-to-day in our -day, um, um, lived experiences? So you're talking about lack of access to resources. And it's not just the financial, but even the capacity, the capacity building that needs to happen around frameworks, around um, you know, um, creating systems and structures and institutions to build what we're we're all building, um, that's lacking. The lack of mentorship, because if you have people um, working in silos, right? Um, like Chopin had mentioned, 
until I met her at the CMC. I didn't even know there was someone in that role. And it was such a relief. Like when we connected, all the other racialized people in that, it was just uh, to heave that sigh of, oh, there's a safe space for us to speak to the issues because otherwise we're listening to panels talking about how they were addressing poverty in racialized communities and all of that. And the questions I had asked them is, how are you tracking this? Right. If you say that the federal government is releasing all those funds, like you'd mentioned, and there's zero mention of the cooperative, you know, of that word, um, then there is a problem because even the sector itself um, is very white. Um, um, Christine had mentioned for co-op developers or co-op organizers, um, uh, for want of a better word, it's also very white. Like if you go on the website, it's just, you're like, whoa. So, so for us, the issue of even having people in the sector, in that space to build the capacity. So we look at the challenges and we look at it right away. What do we need to do? Um, like what Christine and, and, and um, um, Susanna, Freedom Dreams, what they're doing. How do we resource the work that they're doing so that we can have more organizers, more co-op organizers, a pipeline that's been built, right? How do we do that? How do we speak to policy? So again, you look at the work that people like um, Dr. Shanez um, Hossein is doing around interfacing with the institution at the policy level to say, how do we bring, you know, black cooperatives into the picture? Another huge challenge is this idea of the capitalist model, which is very formalized. And for black people, we operate predominantly in the informal sector. Right. And so there's this dichotomy where what is informal is looked down upon because the metrics, what you're using to measure it, it doesn't, there's no alignment. How the informal sector measures wealth, well being, right, that the community is thriving is totally different from a capitalist model. And unfortunately, even the cooperative sector in Canada mimics the capitalist model. And it's important for us to this, to say that, oh, all these great terms, cooperativism, um, um, solidarity economy, they're great if we implement them to be just, equitable, um, diverse, inclusive, and also decolonized. It, 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 it can't be this subtext that's not spoken about. It has to be very explicit. So in terms of the, 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 the um, challenges of even building ecosystem, that's a huge challenge. Because if you're not able to organize, if you don't have the resources to build capacity, it means that you're not able to organize collectively, right? It means that you don't have access into the spaces like how I and Shokwe had met. Um, we we're lucky enough um, 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 to be, you know, um, very open. It was the Canadian Worker um, Corp Federation that had sponsored us to that conference. So if we didn't have the resources and if there was no organization like that to do that, even for the ACE Institute and a lot of all these other, then we wouldn't even be in those spaces. So there's as, as much as we talk of the challenges, I kind of like use a different approach of saying, okay, we, we map out what the challenges are, but what are we going to do about it? What's being done that should be done more? The federation, the different provincial federal organizations and all of that, each of those spaces, we need to find ourselves into those spaces. It was um, Shelly um, Chisong that said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you know, bring your folding chair. And if you have to build your own table, Right, if you come into the table and it doesn't feel right, exit and go build your own so that you can interface with this existing institution as equals. That's what self-determination is. That's one. The other thing around capacity building, let us resource, fight for resources for organizations like Freedom Dreams so that they can build the pipeline of co-op organizers that we need. Christine mentioned something. The existing organizations do not know how to reach out to our communities because our communities do not go into spaces. You have to come to us. That's how we organize. You have to bring that thing to us through trusted elders, through trust, trusted centers of influence that people already 
trust. And that's that Kwanzaa principles, right? You can't just say, oh, the Federation or the Ontario Corp Association is doing something and you expect Black people to come in. There's already a lack of trust because of the history. And it's not a, a mis lack of trust that's just arbitrary. It is based on our lived experience. So how do we educate you know, these institutions from the federal governments to the provincial, to the, um, you know, all other institutions to say, this is how you reach our communities. And how do we take the front seat in that? There's no point bringing black people into rooms and don't give them power. It actually causes more harm. So we need to speak to this and speak to this with authority. So that when we're in spaces, we're not just a token, you know, filling a spot, uh, ESG check mark or whatever. When and anyone is going into any space, do that thing that Maya Angelou says. You're going in with your ancestors. You're going in with the unborn. You're going in with your peers that are not in the room. So if you're in a space and you have to advocate for freedom, dream, do it. You're the 